by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or uh, capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as G Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody, finally after a little pause, to a new reading of Exploding the Israel Deception tonight again with my guest Tom Fress, all over the ocean from the United States of America from Inquisition Update. Tom and me, we have been in some storms the last past years and the last few weeks there were a few other storms. I don't know if Tom wants to go into it, I'm not the one who is about to talk about it. If Tom wants to explain it, he can, but uh, part had to do also with um, the history that Tom had on uh, Inquisition Update for the last 11 years on a broadcast system and I don't know names, I don't name names, people who follow us know exactly what is meant and uh, it was made very hard for me in the past to publish Tom's work and that also set us um, back a little bit. But today we are back fully on part 99 of this wonderful reading, Exploding the Israel Deception, that started with End Time Delusions, both books of Steve Wahlberg, um, who we applaud for his work and which we wonderfully take as a basis for our study. We are still in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we are today about to embark on the journey on verse 7 and uh, read, explain, discuss, analyze that part. But before that, and even before I introduce Tom, I want to read to you a comment um, that I copied out of part 47 of this reading because it is very interesting what that man had to write to us. And I want to read it to you and then welcome Tom, who is going to comment a little bit about what, in this case, Russell S. wrote on the video End Time Delusions number 47, Battle of the Isms. He wrote, Stunning. I have been absorbing this series like a sponge. My attention to eschatology had drifted for a long time. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger here. 
Um, my early days as a new believer, I had dispensationalism pushed onto me. And I think many people can recognize themselves in what Russell S. is writing here. But I remained very inquisitive and questioning. And not before long, I had discarded dispensationalism and ultimately became reformed in my views. But I had remained conf uh, confounded by the eschatological issues until very recently. I did not realize that futurism is a Jesuit counter-reformation theology and that it was the quote-unquote gap theory applied to the 70th week of Daniel, which undergirds all of this false teaching. Now that the full ramifications of this widespread belief are becoming clear to me, I am simply stunned. And the fact that no one, even the reformed Calvinists out there, will say that the Roman papacy is the Antichrist, just stunning. Yes, this was a stunning comment to that video, and uh, I wish I knew this Russell S. and uh, could speak confidentially with him, but he, like the rest of us, with almost no exception, had dispensationalism, futurism, and dispensationalism, and some call it dispensational futurism, shoved down our throats. And uh, the whole, the whole strategy of dispensational futurism is to shift the onus of the Antichrist away from the true Antichrist, the papacy, and shift the blame onto some figment of some future imagination. And what that does is simply destroys Protestantism. Because Protestantism was a protest against the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the papacy. So it is indeed, as this author acknowledges, has learned recently from our broadcast, that dispensational futurism is a war tactic, a counter-reformation war tactic, uh, a, a, a death sentence against biblical Protestantism. And now that dispensational futurism is universally believed and taught in the Protestant and evangelical churches, they're not Protestant and they're not evangelical. They're Roman Catholic because they've exonerated the papacy. No more do they say that the Pope is the Antichrist. And just as this, just as this author acknowledges, he, he says even the Reformed Calvinists out there will not say that the Roman papacy is the Antichrist. Some of the most rabid anti-Roman Catholic, anti-papal preachers and teachers and theologians out there were Calvinists. But they don't identify who the Antichrist is. They don't know who it is. It's yet in the future. He's never, he's never been known in the world, according to these one-time Calvinists. So, so look, if the Calvinists don't know who the Antichrist is, they're not Calvinists, are they? If a Protestant tells you he does not know who the Antichrist is, the Antichrist is future, he's not a Protestant. If an evangelical tells you he does not know who the Antichrist is, he's not evangelical. He's Roman Catholic. They're all Roman Catholic in their eschatology. They're all Roman Catholic in their beliefs. They no longer believe, nor teach, nor understand, nor will they even accept that the papacy and every pope in succession from the very first pope to the very last pope when Jesus returns is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. And you've, you've heard us name multitudes of popes that have ruled from the throne in Rome throughout the, the entire Christian era, but it's still very difficult for even the friends of this, of this broadcast to understand that each one of those popes was the Antichrist of his day. And you have to remember that the Antichrist persecutes the saints, deceives the whole world. And you, 
you're taught that this is in the churches. You're taught that all of this takes place in the lifespan of one antichrist in the future. It hasn't even happened yet. <laughs> but the fact is the antichrist has been a permanent dominant figure in the Christian era from the beginning and he will not end until Christ returns. That's scriptural eschatology. That is scriptural and historical eschatology. And if anybody teaches you differently, he's deceived or he's a Jesuit dupe. And that includes every pastor behind every pulpit in this country. You find a pastor out there that will tell you without taking a breath, who the Antichrist is. It's the popes of Rome all throughout the Christian era. That man you can at least trust with the truth. But you can't find him in this country. Can't find him anywhere in the world. It's too controversial. And uh, they would rather just walk away if they know it. And if they don't know it, shame on them. They've been deceived by dispensational futurism just like this writer, Russell S., who has now come to the light of the historicist truth. And I'm very blessed, privileged, and just speechless that I had a part in opening his eyes. And Yerkes to be commended and, re and uh, recommended also. And uh, this is the fruit of our labor. This is what Yerk and I continue to breathe to receive this is the fruit of our labor this is the garden that we've been put in and we till the soil every day that we can and tell the same truth and it's times like this when we actually get to see some produce from our garden and uh, <clears throat> we we are uh, we're not fame seekers we're not money grubbers we're not claiming things that don't belong to us. We're simply doing the Lord's work. And we do it for free. Okay? That's a very important point. Neither Yerk nor I have ever solicited for financial contributions from listeners. We don't want to be classified with those who love not God, but mammon. And they use God to get mammon. That's the hireling the Bible talks about, the hireling in the churches. Every one of our pastors are hirelings, and they teach us lies, okay? They teach us dispensational, futurist lies, because it pays better. We don't want to be associated with them. We don't want to be linked to them. We could be compared to them because we contrast with them as much as one can. And uh, we don't take contributions, and listen carefully, because I'm going to tell you why. I don't want my mouth or my mind or my spirit or my heart to be controlled by the God-blessed dollar. I don't want a contributor to have control over what I think, what I believe, what I read from the scriptures, what I read from history. I want to tell you the truth no matter what it costs. And if I accept money from people, they're going to pressure me, just like they did on First Amendment radio. I was welcome on First Amendment radio so long as I acknowledged the seventh-day Sabbath but never called it Saturday. Okay? That's the controversy at First Amendment radio. That's why I'm no longer there. Somebody was controlling my mouth. Somebody was controlling my heart. Somebody was controlling my mind. And I departed from the truth just to save my program on First Amendment Radio. And I feel guilty about it. I'm ashamed for it. And I repent of it. And I will never go back to First Amendment Radio. Secondly, first uh, Inquisition update, my program, what I did on the Inquisition Update was intended by God to be free for the saints. Okay? It was a work of love. 
it was truly a ministry, okay, a God-given ministry. It was never intended to be a financial opportunity for anyone. But in my recordings on Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, you can hear me repeatedly, constantly, every day, recommend that my listeners, if they want to make a contribution to Inquisition Update, make a contribution to First Amendment Radio because they had some expenses involved in producing it. Okay? I acknowledge that. Never knew what those expenses were. For all I know, it might have been 50 cents a day. I don't know what it cost him to put it on. I know what it cost me to do it. It uh, may be a computer every five years and every month the cost of an uh, Internet connection. Okay? That was essentially my cost. But it was a work of love. I didn't want to take any money. I didn't want to be linked with those money-grubbing wolves in sheep's clothing behind the pulpits of all the churches. I wanted to be unique. I wanted it to be a truly a ministry. I did it out of my own free will. I did it. Uh, on my own dime, not a not a red cent did I ask for my listeners ever. I did it to maintain the 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 credibility that it deserves. But First Amendment Radio has treated it like a financial opportunity for Nicholas Arthur, the owner of First Amendment Radio, and for his children. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. In the last 11 years that I did First Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, I never placed any restrictions. I never made any contracts, no stipulations, nothing. I said repeatedly on my broadcast, what God gives me, I freely give. But Nicholas Arthur thinks it's an opportunity to make money. So Inquisition Update, when it spouted out of my mouth and out of my belly and out of my heart, the free is over. And Nicholas is going to file uh, uh, copyright claims for anyone who uses those recordings. He's already filed uh, copyright strikes against Yerk Glissman for using those recordings, which I will tell my listeners were paid for by the regular subscription price paid to First Amendment Radio and Nicholas Arthur. Those are bought and paid for. Now listen, if you go to a, a record store and you buy a record, you own rights to do whatever you want with that record unless you make copies of it and sell it to somebody. And none of us ever do that. We use the record, we play the record, we enjoy the record, we share it with friends and, uh, and family and, and neighbors that come to see us and one thing and another, and it gets disseminated that way without any money changing hands. That's legitimate use. Nobody can sue anybody over that. Well, that's the same right I want with my program. But Nicholas Arthur wants exclusivity. He doesn't want anybody else posting any of my recordings, whether they were paid for by subscription price or not, to show up on uh, YouTube. And we're not, we're poor people. We can't afford to go out and get an attorney to counter sue. So here we are living with this counter, this copyright strike, and there's no remedy unless we can afford attorney, an attorney and really take care of it in a court of law. Here's what I think. I think God ought to judge. God knows what Inquisition Update was. It was a work of love. It was intended to be free, yes, to cover the expenses of First Amendment Radio, maybe make a little uh, pocket money, pizza money for his kids but to be a financial opportunity. <laughs> Listen, I've never made any restrictions. Nicholas Arthur can charge as much as he wants for that broadcast. If people want to subscribe to First Amendment Radio and pay the subscription price and get paid for copies of Inquisition Update, I highly encourage you, even now, still, which has been uninterrupted for the last 11 years. I've never had a controversy. 
with with First Amendment Radio selling Inquisition Update to cover expenses. But he's had that opportunity for 11 years. How much more cost is there to cover? How much more cost is there to cover? All I ask is that I be not harassed, neither myself, nor Yurt Glisman, nor anyone else who wants to use those prescription paid records to play on YouTube. There should be no copyright claims whatsoever. Nobody's making money here. I've said my piece. I've done it publicly in front of God, in front of Yerk, in front of my listeners, in front of my conscience, and I've told the truth. That's where it stays. Now, do you really want to be a subscriber to First Amendment Radio if he plays these legal tactics like this for selfishness alone? What God gives me I freely give. That will never change. Inquisition update is con going to continue as long as I have a breath. YouTube is only one of my avenues, and I intend to use it to the fullest for free. What I receive from the Lord, I freely give. And I give anyone permission to use my recordings any way they see fit as long as they're not making money. So if you want to create another YouTube channel and, 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 uh, and feature Inquisition Update, you have my permission. It's my intellectual property. It's my reading. It was my books paid for. It was protected by fair use clause of the copyright laws. There was nothing illegal about it. It was free, and I intended it to be free, and I'm going to make it free if I have to read all those books all over again on YouTube. How do you like them apples, Mr. Arthur? Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I didn't know that you were going that deep into that subject, but uh, that's okay, and I think, these, I think these things needed to be said. And I'm not going to dwell on that now, maybe on some other time. I want to go back to the comment of Russell S. Because I see myself in what he wrote here. In the midst of his paragraph, he said, I did not realize that futurism is a Jesuit counter-reformation theology and that it was the quote-unquote gap theory applied to the 70th week of Daniel, which undergirds all of this false teaching. This is exactly where I find myself back in what he writes here, because I was of the same understanding and the same misconception when I started quote unquote waking up when I as a newborn new, uh, uh, newborn Christian came into this world and studied the word of God with all my power that I had at that time I read many other books too I still up to today I haven't read the Bible in completion I'm now at first Kings and find it a wonderful book in the Old Testament the New Testament we did together but when I by the grace of God, discovered God's word, I was, and you know that, Tom, um, in company of people like Alan Lamont, in company oh, yes. of people like uh, Walt Stickel, um, oh, yes. Wayne Michael, and yes. Michael Adams, and so on, and so on. And I had no idea that this seven-year, quote-unquote, tribulation is torn out of a tiny little part of the Old Testament. Yeah. Because when you just look at what it is, we are speaking about four verses. Verses 24, 26, 25, 26, and 27 of Daniel chapter 9. And especially, of course, verses 20, verse 26. This tiny little part we are talking about, and mm -hmm. this they took out of there, and that's what they built their whole 
lie on, their whole false teaching on, on the yes. 70th week. And I had no idea that it was based on that. I just thought, seven-year tribulation, yeah, that sounds agreeable. That sounds acceptable in my mind. But did I know where they take it from? No. And then I got to know you. And by you, I was introduced into the real understanding of Daniel chapter 9, and that from that little part, they took this eschatology, and by that, they have deceived, up to today, the whole world. The whole world. I want him to emphasize it again. The whole world. And is that not what it says in the scripture? He deceiveth the whole world. And now you know exactly what they did, to deceive the whole world. They took one little piece of scripture, just like the Bible says, they twist the scriptures to their own destruction. But they didn't destroy just themselves when they tw twisted that scripture. They have destroyed the entire Christian community. The, the entire, quote unquote, Christian world. Because now they don't know who the Antichrist is. They believe in a future seven-year period of time when, in fact, that was Jesus' ministry. From his baptism to the crucifixion three and a half years later to the going forth of the gospel to the Gentiles three and a half years after that. A seven-year period of time called the 70th week of Daniel. But these fools behind the pulpits, these wolves in sheep's clothing, these dispensational futurists, these Jesuit dupes, have cast that seven-year period of time to the end of time just before Christ returns. What does that say? Jesus was not the Messiah. Do you understand? If you're a dispensational futurist like I was for 50 years of my life, you say Jesus is the Christ out of one side of your mouth, and then out of the other side of your mouth, you say that Jesus has never come in the flesh. The 70th week of Daniel is yet future. You see how they've tricked you? Deceived the whole world. Every pastor behind every pulpit in this world preaches dispensational futurism in one form or another. No, and, and, and the, the most outright evidentiary fact that, dis, that exposes this is that they can't tell you who the Antichrist is. And I've told you before. What a malevolent God we must worship to make sure we know who Jesus is and then hide from us the identity of the Antichrist, the one who has deceived the whole world. It is not tenable. The loving, most merciful God who gave his only begotten son that we might live would surely be just as careful to make sure we knew who the one was that was going to deceive the whole world. And do you realize if you're a dispensational futurist, you're calling God the most malevolent being in the universe to cause his son to bleed and die, to suffer our punishment in our stead, to take away the, the, the wickedness out of our lives and bury it forever, separate us from our sins, as far as the east is from the west, and then leave us vulnerable to this one who would deceive the whole world by not telling us who he was? That's what the whole Christian world believes. They worship a malevolent God. Are you going to believe that? Are you going to believe that malarkey? My God was merciful when he sent his son to bleed and die for me. And he was merciful also when he gave me the scriptures that positively, without a doubt, with no shred of doubt, identifies perfectly, unmistakably, unerringly who the Antichrist is, was, and always will be. It's the Pope of Rome. Paul said, he who now letteth will let. Who was reigning? Who was restraining the rise of Antichrist during the life of Paul and the first century church? It was the Caesars of Rome. They couldn't, the papacy couldn't come to power as long as the Caesars were still in power. But when they were taken out of the way, then that wicked was revealed. And they anticipated his coming. They knew he would be a Roman because Daniel prophesied the fourth and final beast world government on the world was going to be Roman. 
Remember, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And it's still Rome. To this day, the, the Caesars of Rome became the papal Caesars of Rome. Nothing has changed. It's still the fourth and final beast ruling over the kings of the earth, persecuting God's people, just like Yerk and I are being persecuted and threatened with Roman Catholic canon law, which is in the form of copyright violations. Now ask yourself, is First Amendment Radio a godly ministry or is it a business opportunity? Look, I don't want to mix the issues. Your church is, was, and has always taught, at least in your lifetime, that the God who merciful, mercifully sent Jesus to bear our sins on his body and take our punishment so that we might live, that same God who sent his son has kept it a secret from us who the Antichrist is. That's what your church teaches you. Are you going to live with that? Are you going to stay in the pews and be comfortable with that nonsense? Look, there's got to come a time in the life of a man that he will no longer listen to nonsense. Those who deny the Son deny the Father also. And when you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, you deny the Son. There's no way of getting around it. You deny the Son, and you deny the Father also. This is a salvific issue. This is the greatest issue that you can even name in Christendom today. All of Christendom is dying because they believe a lethal lie. Have I made my point? Do you need more clarification? I'll give it until my dying breath. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, that's what this whole broadcast is all about, that you are still giving it. I just wanted to make the point that I, like Russell, was in the same way deceived in the beginning and didn't know that they used the 70th week of Daniel, which undergirds all of this false teaching. And the point is, because it is so hard to understand, because it's such a small little part, it is so little to find. We are pushing on that again and again and again and again until, <laughs> I almost say until the end of time, until the end of our breath. That's because right. Because there's nothing more important than that to tell you that, nothing. that the papacy is the Antichrist. There is no future fulfilling of the Daniel 70th week because Jesus Christ fulfilled it perfectly and completely, sealed up the scroll 2,000 years ago. That's right. And Paul spoke about that in 2 Thessalonians 2, which brings us back to our initial broadcast subject today. Yep. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. It reads... For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The emphasis of the letter now is, of course, done by me. Now, before I will let Tom speak about this, I want Tom to think about if he wants to address this point here. At a certain point, time in the past, Tom read a wonderful book from Michael the Semlian on First Amendment Radio and Inquisition Update, The Foundations Under Attack, and also his other book, uh, All Roads Lead to Rome, I think. Anyway, uh, in that second book, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, that Michael the Semlian quoted verse 7 of Second Thessalonians 2, but he left out the word now. Now, I don't know if Tom wants to go into that, because for me, this is a very, very important part, at least as important as the things that we already spoke about. But otherwise, I will just, Tom, leave a little comment on Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, before oh, we go into what is, this, Steve Wahlberg wrote about this here. 
Yeah, this is, uh, you can leave the quote up there so I can see it. Okay. But, yes, please, please. Uh, this is critical. I, I could very well spend the rest of the broadcast emphasizing the importance of this. This is critical. This is the one of the absolutely necessary elements to promote futures, futurist dispensationalism is to take that word now out of that passage. The word now is the most critical word in that entire passage. Paul is telling us who the Antichrist will soon be. Okay? The mystery of iniquity. That is the Antichrist who has not yet been revealed. That's why it's a mystery. You don't yet know. But Paul is giving the first century church under his ministry in Thessalonica words that cannot be misunderstood about who the future Antichrist will be. The soon coming Antichrist will be. Remember, Jesus cannot return until that man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition. Okay? So Hymenaeus and Philetus have been going around telling everybody that Jesus had already returned in the spirit. Paul was setting the record straight. No, no, no. Jesus didn't return because when he returns, he's going to be a visible return. Hymenaeus and Philetus are dragging people away, following themselves. Here's the truth. The mystery of iniquity, that is the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Judas priest, is already in the making. He was speaking about Hymenaeus and Philetus' assertion that Jesus had already come in the flesh, invisibly, or rather in the spirit, invisibly. That evolved, as I explained the last time we got together, that evolved into the necessity of having a visible head to represent Jesus who is invisible in this new found kingdom of Christ. And that leads to the papacy. That's how the papacy got its initial start, even as Paul was preaching. Hymenaeus and Philetus. Simon Magus is part of that equation too. We won't go into that now. We've gone into it before. But Paul's setting the record straight. He's telling you that this man of sin, this mystery of iniquity, is already in the making only with with one thing you have to know he says only he who now letteth the he who now restrains the rise of this mystery of iniquity this papal antichrist must be taken out of the way first the man of sin then will be revealed and only after that will Christ return. Hymenaeus and Philetus are liars, deceivers, and, 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 and causing the saints to abandon the truth and follow a lie that the mystery of iniquity was already in the making with Hymenaeus and Philetus' teaching that Christ had returned visibly or invisibly in the spirit, which necessitates a physical vicar or replacement or representative, okay? A human mouthpiece that everybody can see on the TV, if you'll understand my meaning. Someone to speak for Christ because this invisible Christ doesn't have a, a, a voice, does he? Are you getting the drift? It is the very seed that germinated into the papal antichrist. The physical, visible head of the so-called Christian church. It's the church of Hymenaeus and Philetus and Simon Magus. Now, Paul acknowledges these 
these liars, these deceivers that are going to deceive the whole world. And we see that today with futurism. This man of sin, this papal man of sin is the author of dispensational futurism. Okay, who was then, as Paul was speaking, who was re- who was then at that time restraining the rise of this papal antichrist? Well, look, there can't be two governments of Rome. A two-headed beast cannot live. They fight one another to death, right? Just tie two cats' tails together and see what happens. So the Caesars have to take, be taken out of the way before the papal Roman government can stand up. Paul was telling them in clandestine terms who was then in power. He who now letteth will let or restrain until he be taken out of the way. Now, he's using the singular, but we know there were many Caesars in succession, one right after another, throughout the entire pagan Roman Empire. But the Bible refers it to as one single human being. What is he referring to? An office, okay? Uh, Just like the presidency of the United States. One president replaces another. They can only live three score and ten years. When they die, they have to be replaced with another, a successor, right? But the office continues. So when we refer to any of the various presidents that have served in the Oval Office ever since the beginning of this country, we refer to him as Mr. President, don't we? It's a single person, right? So that's exactly what's being said here. He, that is the many Caesars in succession throughout the entire Roman Empire, he who now letteth or restrains will restrain the rise of this mystery of iniquity until he be taken out of the way. And he has to be taken out of the way. No Caesar of the powerful and wicked Roman Empire was ever going to be challenged by a pope. Got it? So if the pope is ever going to rule, as the Bible clearly indicates he will, the Caesars have to be taken out of the way. And that's exactly what happened. And these are referred to in the Revelation chapter 13 as the first beast and the second beast. The first beast received a mortal wound, was taken out of the way. And then that wicked was revealed. That mystery of iniquity rose up as the Pope, head, chief, priest, and Caesar of the Roman Empire. The pagan Roman Empire became the papal Roman Empire. This is what Paul's describing right here. And he has to do it in clandestine terms because if his letter to the Thessalonians had ever reached Rome, if it had ever been confiscated and sent back to Rome, there'd be Roman armies all over Thessalonica. Peter would, or Paul would have been killed and, and the people scattered and they never would have gotten this message to the rest of the Christian world. It was very, very important that this letter be preserved. And it was. And now we read it in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 7. Now, Paul had to speak clandestinely in that letter. But he said in the letter, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? So what do you think language Paul used when he was in their presence telling them beforehand what this mystery of iniquity was that was soon going to come to power in place of the Roman Caesars. That's exactly what he was telling them. This mystery of iniquity, this antichrist, this little horn that Daniel prophesied to come, could only come if the Caesars were taken out of the way. He didn't call him the letter. He didn't call him, he who now letteth will let. No, he said the papal, he said the Roman Caesars. Okay? There was no question. No need to mince words. They were in private behind closed doors. There were no Roman soldiers standing around. There were no Roman allies among the saints. 
in Thessalonica. He told them flat out who this restrainer was. It's the Caesars, the same one who killed our Messiah. He's going to be taken out of the way, and then that which is even worse will rise in his place. The biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist who would rule and reign over the kings of the earth throughout the entire Christian era and would not be destroyed until Jesus returns. Has Jesus returned? Has it, have you seen the lightning coming out of the east and shining even unto the west? Have you seen that Messiah coming on the clouds full of glory? No. So you must comprehend that that papal Caesar still rules this world. And your preacher's not telling you about it. Is that a problem with you? It's a problem with me. Back to you, York. Well, I, I'm sorry that I have to spoil this a little bit because there are two points of, to me, very great interest that we should speak about. And that means that just in the probably next broadcast, we can really go into the complete analysis together with Steve Wahlberg of verse 7 of Second Thessalonians 2. The two points that I want to address, and you just in lengthy, wonderful explanation uh, told the people, who is the he who now letteth? It is the word he that is so abused by today's churches to speak of the he as the Holy Spirit, for crying oh, out loud, yes. and not yes. as the Caesars. They twist the word of God in every way, shape, or form they can even imagine. This is one thing I want you to consider when you just give your reply to me. And the second point that I want to mention is that how important these damn little words are. Here it is now, and in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it is he. Right. You leave out the word now here and you have no idea what he's talking about and you change the word he from Jesus Christ who fulfilled Daniel 70 as we completely to the Antichrist is coming and again you change the complete eschatology. One little word. Right. In is this case, a three-letter word. Abused. And also, of course, you have the he here, but the three-letter yeah. word or the two-letter word. But it's, it's, it's both are two little words. I mean, two or three letters, Tom. Both are little words. Let's acknowledge that's that. That's all you got to do. <laughs> that's all you got to do to destroy the truth. Just change two little words in the Bible on the meaning of them. That's right. In Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty-seven, the meaning of the word he has changed from Jesus Christ to a coming antichrist, and here. If you just leave the word out, no one knows what it is, or the meaning is changed when we know by the history of Second Thessalonians and Paul's ministry that he speaks about the Roman Caesars. And it is taught in these churches today all over the world that he who now letteth is the Holy Spirit, is the comforter that Jesus Christ sent to be with us until the end of time. I think, Tom, those are two points that you should address for the final moments of our video, because I do not think that we have time to go into the rest of Second Thessalonians well, 2.7. Well, we look, will do that next time, but these let, points let me, really me, need your explanation. Let me, do it this, let me do it this way. Let me just read uh, this passage of, of, of Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7, in the very way that it appears in Michael DeSemlian's book. Yeah. Let me read it to you, and you can see for yourself what a tremendous change it makes in that passage. Now here's verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now you tell me from that, and I'll read it again. You tell me from that who he's talking about. You can't. There's no way you can even begin to comprehend he's trying to tell you about someone specific. As a matter of fact, without the word now, it's grammatically useless. 
It makes no sense. Let me read it again. Listen carefully. This is what all the perverted Bibles do, or most of them do. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Does that make any sense to you? Only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What does that mean? Can you make any grammatical sense out of that at all? And if you can't make any grammatical sense out of it, how can you call it the word of God? Are you accusing God of not making grammatical sense? No. The word now is missing. I think, Tom, this is one of the points where you uh, recognize why the apocryphal books are not part of um, the Bible. Now, what, that's a whole different subject. That's a whole different subject. But every that, time when I have a look into one of the apocryphal books, I don't have the feeling that the sentence make the sentences make grammatically or common sense. Yeah. And that's that, the difference that, with the Bible. That puts them in a realm of mystery. Yeah. But the Bible is called the good news because it's no mystery. It tells us the truth. The hard, rock hard truth. And we have this passage in the true Bibles. The word now is present. And now it makes perfect sense. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's already in the working. Only he who now letteth, he who now restrains, will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then that wicked shall be revealed. The word now is absolutely essential for you to understand that Paul is talking about the Roman Caesars. And not the Holy Spirit. Without, without the word now, you don't know what he's talking about. And that's why they took the word out. Because if you know he's talking about the Roman Caesars and that they will be taken out of the way, then that man of sin will be revealed. And all you got to do is read even the poorest history book and you'll find out who that power was that replaced the Caesars. Nobody argues about it. The Roman Catholic papacy acknowledges it. Everybody acknowledges it. it but if for this passage, you know that the one who follows the Caesars is that mystery of iniquity. The proof positive Identity of the Antichrist was given by Paul to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, and the word now makes that certain. Without the word now, there's no certainty at all. Now you can have the future Antichrist that fits in with dispensational futurism. Do you see how critical now the word now is in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7? Get out your Bible. Go to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, and if the word now is missing, burn that Bible. Don't let it fall into anyone else's hands because it will help the Jesuits with their future dispensationalism and the deception of the whole world. Because that's what has resulted from changing the word now or taking it out of that passage. The whole world is deceived now. And we've got to stop it. Souls are at stake. Because if you deny that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Jesus 2,000 years ago, then you've denied that Jesus was the Christ. You've denied that Messiah has come in the flesh. If you talk about a future seven-year period of time, you, I don't care what you call it, whether you call it the Great Tribulation or whether you call it anything else, you're really talking about Jesus' ministry 2,000 years ago. Okay? You're just part and parcel of the Jesuit-led counter-reformation. If you believe and if you teach a future seven-year period of time, then you have with your own mouth denied that Jesus was the Christ. See how perfectly they've deceived the whole world? I don't like that very well. Do you? 
Many people criticize me for the angry tone of my voice. And if you can't understand now why I'm angry, then I dare say you can't comprehend what I'm trying to tell you. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think the listeners have quite some things to talk about and think about until we come together next time, because I don't really want to go into what Steve Wolberg had to write here and what we have to analysis also, because we are only left with five or six minutes to complete the hour. And um, I want the people's attention uh, on what we said so far. And I surely want the people's attention on what we have to say next time. Um, that's why I want to bring the video here to an end. I think that was a very important message. And I also think that it is for some people interesting to learn that there are similarities in the way that you learn the Word of God, that you understand the Word of God, that you build up your wisdom out of reading Scripture. When you see what our commentator of the video, uh, Russell, uh, was his name, Russell uh, went through, when he was so surprised that um, futurism is a Jesuit counter-reformation theology and that the gap theory is only applied to the 70th week of Daniel, that that is the little thing that really undergirds all of this false teaching, that he experienced that and I experienced exactly the same thing. So, well, you and, Tom, and Tom to a certain amount too. So the point is, we are not unique in this regard, and you are not re uh, unique in this regard. We have all been betrayed by people who we are taught to trust. Quote unquote, authorities, our parents, our teachers, our pastors, people like that. And I don't say that our parents deceived us willingly. Most of the time they deceived us because they didn't, just didn't know better. And sometimes it's the children that learn the truth and then have to teach their parents the truth. That's a very hard thing to do. And I can tell you, Tom has told me hours of that experience of his lifetime. And you probably have experience of that in your own lifetime. But the point is, when you go through that comment of Russell again, you understand that we have all been deceived. That all the teaching that we had taken into us was wrong. And only if we read the Bible for ourselves. And for English speaking people, please. The 1611 AV King James Bible is the word that you should study according to my understanding and according to Tom's understanding. Maybe you have a different understanding, I don't know, but we can only say we promote this Bible. <laughs> we don't own, we don't earn anything by telling you to buy that or to get it online or whatever, but this is the true Word of God. The 1611 King James Bible. And preferably not the 1769 Blaney version, but that again is another discussion. And, and also that Bible maybe here and there has a point of discussion and understanding, but then it is just the way how you read it. And I learned that the more I read it for myself, word by word, and remember these words that I'm saying right now because they are very important for the next broadcast too. The more that you read the Bible for yourself, word by word, and digest every word, make it your own, get the understanding from reading and studying yourself, not by listening to Tom or to me or anybody else. The more you digest that, and then you ruminate on that again and again and again, the more you will gain understanding and get wisdom. But because the Bible says so, wisdom comes from the Word of God, reading the Word of God. There's no other way to gain wisdom, except, of course, you want Gnosticism. But that's not what you want as a true Christian. Gnosticism is what brought us the whole misery of futurism in the first place. And that's what we're going to make an end to, especially with these teachings.
So you see what Russell went through, what I went through, what Tom went through. We are not unique. You are not unique. We are all in that kind, the same betrayed family and coming together now to the knowledge of the truth through the King James Bible version. That is my final statement for today, Tom, and I'd like to hear yours. I love the points that you made, <clears throat> and I hope they stick to the ribs of the listeners. Wonderful nourishment. Now, I'm going to close with this. We serve a holy, eternal, loving, benevolent God. A gracious God. He understands our predicament. And he made a way out. He gave us his only begotten son that would take our punishment. That would make it possible for us to live in peace with God. Restored. Redeemed. Reconciled with God. That's what Daniel prophesied, isn't it? Make reconciliation for iniquity. Make an end of sin. Fulfill the prophecy and the vision. That's what Daniel prophesied, and that's exactly what Jesus did. God gave us his only begotten son that we might live. And he also sent Daniel, Paul, and John to tell us who that man of sin who would deceive the whole world would positively be so that none of us, none of his chosen, none of his elect, none that were washed in the blood of his precious only begotten son could ever be deceived. We know who the Antichrist is. We've always known in every generation from the Thessalonian church that Paul preached to today, we have always known who the Antichrist is. It's the papacy. No loving, merciful, graceful God who would sacrifice his own son for our behalf would leave us in doubt about who that man of sin would be. And we've got three witnesses in the Bible. Let everything be established by two or three witnesses. We have three witnesses in the Bible describing this man of sin, this papal antichrist, Daniel, Paul, and John. There are your three witnesses. And this belief that the papacy is the antichrist is the very reason that the saints of every age throughout the entire Christian era have been martyred because they too knew who the papal antichrist was and they would never shut up about it. And they named him by name. They damned him by his works. They exposed him to the saints so that no one would be deceived. They exposed and revealed who the antichrist was just like Paul did, just like Daniel did, and just like John did. And that's the mark of the saints, that they condemn and identify and make sure no one is deceived by the papal Antichrist. We are the same gracious, benevolent, loving, <clears throat> redeemed souls that Jesus died for, and we've got the same message. Now, you're no longer deceived. Welcome to the truth. Thanks for listening.